Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about how to and why you should set up your crypto and Web3 company in the UAE. Um, I think it's um, quite a good time to have this discussion, given that we've just um, had token 2049. And there's a lot of um, discussions and interest in the crypto and Web3 world at the moment. And Dubai is very, very clearly um, shown that it wants to be the crypto capital of the world. Um, and I'll be discussing that along with my co-host, um, Ohanis Koyunjan um, from ACX Compliance. And what we'll do is we'll try and leave some time at the end um, to answer any questions that you may have. But the, the, the idea here today is to give you an overview of how you set the company up, where you should set it up, and what the compliance considerations are. So it's very, very sector specific today rather than a general sort of setup and um, discussion. So Ohanis is my co-host. Um, he has a background in banking and compliance uh, with roles at PwC, and he now leads the compliance efforts at ACX Compliance. He specializes in guiding virtual asset service providers. Ohanis focuses on fortifying digital asset operations through rigorous off-chain and on-chain analysis and ACX Compliance seek to advance the compliance standards in the crypto space, and most importantly, assist you through your licensing journey and the compliance steps that you need to take um, to become an operational entity in the UAE. So I'll, pa I'll pass it over to our hands just to introduce himself and, and ACX Compliance. Thank you, Gary, for the introduction. Uh, quite you were on point in the introduction and everything. Just want to introduce a bit of the, about our company, ACX, what we do and how uh, we're here in this market and doing this webinar. We're basically a one-stop shop for your all uh, for all crypto, uh, crypto companies when it comes to their needs in compliance, community management, and uh, customer support. Our main focus now is supporting VASP integrating into the UAE market. They're trained to uh, the, the VASP that are trying to expand here in the market supporting them in their licensing needs, starting them with them from the very beginning up until they get the full operational license from the regulators here. And afterwards, continuing to support them in their operational needs as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, AML, scale by C remediations, uh, SAR filings, transaction monitoring, off-chain, on-chain analysis, and all of the in-between the boring company in the back, in the back, just trying to make sure that the that the VASP can focus on their core business, where make sure that the, whenever the regulator knocks, you, uh, they'll find everything clean and ready and steady and ready to be reported to them. Yeah, and exactly. You you might say it's the, the boring job, Bohannis, but ultimately it's one of the most important jobs because ultimately if you don't comply, you don't have a license and you can't operate. And the real advantage of the UE at the moment is the sort of forward thinking steps that we're taking with the regulations um, to stop problems that happened in the past and to give confidence in the world that we can we can actually develop um, and, and move towards more blockchain uh, focused Web3 applications. So exactly. m moving over to myself. So I, I, I'm Gary Thompson. I'm the commercial director at VirtuZone. Um, I've been in the region since 2017, and and I've been with VirtuZone uh, since I moved here. I am a lawyer by background, and I deal with the company setup process, whether it be a, an everyday entrepreneur or a large multinational or a listed company. We can guide you through your journey to enter the region, to expand in the region, and uh, to assist you um, in the company formation process, because although... On the face of it, it should be easy. Um, there's so many choices and so much wrong information out there. It's important that you have someone independent guiding you towards the correct solution for you rather than the correct solution for them. And VirtuZone was founded in 2009, and we're the leading company formation um, specialist in the UE. We have over 200 employees, and we've dealt with 70,000 transactions. We have multiple offices throughout the UE. And at the moment, um, our primary focus is on the UAE, um, but that may expand to the GCC in the near future. And not only do we have VirtuZone, which focuses on the company formation side of things, uh, we also have VZX, which is crypto-focused specifically. 
We have NGE, which ha which offers second citizenships um, to those who, who wish to have a second passport. And we also now uh, have adapted with the market and we, we have a, a, a tax and accounting firm, which is called Tax Ready. And that can help you with all the compliance requirements that have now been introduced in the UAE because um, honestly, I've not I've never seen so much change in one year in any country that I've lived in or any country that I've dealt with. But in the last year, we've had the introduction of, of, of corporation tax, we've had compliance, we've had the economic substance regulations, AML, the crypto world has exploded. So it's a very, very good time to be in the region, but you need to be on top of all of the changes. So why why the UE? Um why why would you want to set up here? So it's a good geographical location. You can serve um, most of the world from here within the working day. And um, there are good tax benefits, which we'll touch on later. Um, although corporation tax has been introduced recently, it's not been a negative per se. Actually, in my view, it's been a positive because what it's done is it's opened up Dubai to more of the world that previously didn't come here because it was, it was a deemed tax haven. And those who are already here, who are already operating, they might complain, they might not be happy about paying 9%, but ultimately they know, and we know, that there's not many other countries you can go to where you would happily live and you pay so little tax. And um, infrastructure in Dubai is fantastic, except when it rains. And the key thing for the crypto and Web3 world is the regulatory framework. So we have VARA, which is the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority, which deals with free zones mainland, apart from um, DIFC and ADGM. We now have um, DIFC, which has the Dubai Financial Services Authority as a regulator, who recently, let's say, have introduced uh, crypto regulations. But contrary to popular belief, there's not many crypto-focused companies in DIFC. And there's ADGM, who were kind of the market leader in the crypto world with the Financial Services Regulatory Authority, specific to ADGM. And um, now we now you have options, whereas before you didn't really have options. It was ADGM or nothing, and it was wait a year or nothing. Um, but now with VARA, um, there, there's more choice, there's more options, and Ohanis will touch on that later. Um, as I said at the beginning, Dubai and the UAE is very, very keen to be a crypto hub. There's not many countries in the world that make a decision and act on it so quickly. Um, the barriers to change and the barriers to progress don't um, exist in the UAE like they do in other countries. Dubai can make a change overnight. Um, often they make a change before they actually know what the process is going to be. Um, most of the time that's for, the, for good. Sometimes it's confusing and frustrating if you're used to a jurisdiction where someone says it's going to be five days and it's actually five days. But once you get over um, the UAE and, and everything isn't always black and white and everything isn't always the timeline that people say it's going to be, um, it's generally it's a very, very good place to do business. It's very, very easy to do business. Um, it's, it's a culture where everyone wants to help one another. And it's a great place to live, which is good for attracting talent. Um, and I'm sure you probably have some views on why the UAE, Johannes. Yes, uh, one of the main points that I want to touch on when it comes to UAE, especially the regulatory framework in it, is unlike anywhere else in the world currently, the regulator wants our uh, the, co uh, the companies in our community to join UAE market. So usually when applying for a license here in UAE, we feel welcomed from the regulator. They want us to be here. They want us to operate. They want us to comply. Whereas in some different uh, jurisdictions, the regulator is not so much welcoming to crypto because there's still the uh, there's still the risk factor involved that traditional financial regulators regulators think that there's a huge risk factor where it comes to Dubai they know they understand how the crypto market operates they understand uh, what what are the requirements and how to mitigate those risks and usually companies here in Dubai are feel welcomed by the regulator which is a huge huge advantage for the uh, industry here and as you said like dubai is currently the hub i think the token 2049 uh, event that you were talking about is what the it was the coming out party for crypto in dubai i think the only way up you're know, moving from here yeah absolutely and and 
changes so easy here. Um, it, if if something needs to get better, if if the banks need to up their game, the government is quite happy to put the pressure or, or make the change that that needs to happen. And every day the processes are getting better. Every day the availability of banking and other facilities is getting better. So I I just see is really going from strength to strength in the region. Um, and then if, if we just look at just the general landscape of the UAE, um, what type of companies can you set up? What's the difference? What's the advantages, the disadvantages? So we have three main types of company. We have um, free zone companies, we have mainland companies, and we have offshore or holding companies. Um, free zone companies are most popular um, in, in the crypto world. A free zone company... Um, is a, is a fixed geographical area. You're you're supposed to do business within the free zone or remotely or outside of the UAE. And you can provide remote services. You can have your office location inside the free zone. You have 100% ownership. And sometimes there's tax advantages to being in a free zone. Not as many tax advantages as we initially thought, but sometimes there are tax advantages to being in the free zone. And the most popular ones from my perspective, Anna, maybe you've got a different view, but as, as DWTC is the is the home of VARA, that's usually the first choice um, because people want to be near the regulator. They want to be in, in, in a sphere where there's other like-minded companies. So I think DWTC is leading the way in terms of non-financial regulated free zones. Yes, DWTC is the home of VARA. People are uh, companies are looking to set up their entities as well. However, I don't want to downplay the MCC's uh, influence in here. They have an amazing team there, uh, there at the MCC, especially their crypto center, where they're trying to support the community, to support uh, all the entities that are joining them in every way possible through different, different, different events, different uh, webinars, and everything included. That I think. Uh, to the two go place for crypto entities currently in Dubai, it should be between DWTC and DMCC. Both of them ha have some differences. There are some advantages for each. Uh, it's uh, dependent on what the company is actually looking to gain from it. But yes, I agree with you, the, Gary, that DWC is the home of Vara, is the place to be. And so as the MCC with their uh, crypto center and what the team there are doing currently. Yeah. And what a lot of people forget is that the idea of VARA is that you can essentially set your company up in any free zone, but yep. some free zones have made more advanced steps than others in terms of introducing the relevant activities, in terms of adopting the framework. Uh, some are still a little bit apprehensive about about the, the implications of, of crypto. So uh, as, a, as a sort of go-to, DWTC and DMCC would be the, the first two um, on in front of your mind and there's advantages disadvantages of each and that's where we can discuss it and Hannah's can discuss it and we have we have kind of a lot of live cases that that we work on together um so we can give you real feedback rather than theoretical theme but rather than theoretical feedback and there's there's a kind of dark horse in the market and the dark horse in the market is uh rack dow um, and it's not DAO in the traditional sense that, that everyone understands DAO. It's the Digital Assets Oasis, and it's a little bit of a play on a play on words now. What Rack DAO are trying to do is they're trying to make a crypto community for non-regulated crypto companies. So they're they're the only free zone that really can give you an end-to-end -end prop trading company. Um, all other free zones struggle with banking, whereas with RackDAO, they have a partnership with a particular bank and prop trading is possible. Also, they have quite a unique um, freelance ability. So let's say you have a large crypto company that's located in America, located in Europe. They want talent. They want programmers. They want accountants. They want all these different people to work for them, but they don't necessarily want to pay the European prices, the US prices. You, you can pick up a pool of talent here. They can get their visa. They can get their freelance permit remotely, work in a hub that's focused on the crypto community and do the work remotely for, for the crypto companies. So there's, there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of um, uh, companies that are starting to do that sort of outsource model now. And we've had a, we've had a question or two questions actually that I can just answer now. So, are there any banks working with crypto companies yet? Yes, of 
absolutely. Um, there are some big crypto players like Crypto.com, for example, who have just been regulated. Uh, I know that they're they're working with certain banks. Um, block trading uh, asked by Ash is um, it's proprietary trading. So essentially, if you want to have a company that buys and sells crypto with its own funds, that would be classed as proprietary trading. Now, actually, it's more advantageous if you live here to buy and sell crypto under your own name because you don't have any tax implications. But for some that have a, have a, a large sum of money, they're operating from another country, etc., having a, a company here that does the trading is beneficial. Um, mainland, don't forget about mainland. Just Mm, sorry. Just Gary, I want to touch a bit on the prop trading uh, okay. thing as well. Mostly the reason that people are getting into prop trading entities instead of doing on their own because they are pulling money from different traders, joining forces because crypto is live. Crypto is 24-7. It never sleeps. So just to be on the top of it, people are joining forces, creating an entity and doing trading 24-7. That's something that we're seeing in the market currently now as well. Yes. And, and and you just need to be careful with that in the UAE so that you don't take yourself from an unregulated company to a regulated company. If you're joining forces, then you want to join forces as shareholders. So let's say you've exactly. five, five big players, all five of them should become should become um shareholders. Um they can then employ a task force of however many people they want to trade on their behalf and paying nine percent is a small price to pay if you've got hundred people doing trading rather than one. So so yes, uh, absolutely, Linus. I think that's a good point. Um mainland, don't forget about mainland. Mainland is traditionally my favorite. Um it's usually my go-to because it's the most flexible um historically. About 90 to 95 percent of the geographical area of Dubai is mainland. So if you want to have flexibility in terms of office, if you want to have flexibility in terms of larger amount of visa quota for employees, generally mainland is, is the go-to. And mainland does actually have some uh, crypto activities available. Um, Bohannes and I are working on uh, on one particular case where where the, the client is is uh, very, very keen on mainland and we're, we're working through the process on mainland. So mainland can deal with commercial activities, industrial activities, and professional activities. Um, and then we ha then we have offshore. So offshore is ultimately a holding structure. So uh, if you want to have lots of shareholders, or the shareholders may change quite regularly, or you want to have the protection of a common law jurisdiction rather than Sharia law, then putting in a holding company um, as soon as possible is, is advantageous. Also, if you want to do um, fund seeding. Round, round A, round B, round C, et cetera. People who are going to invest in your company or who are going to invest large amounts in your company would be much more comfortable investing into a tier one financial jurisdiction holding company than a Sharia law company. Um, it just gives a more robust uh, legal system. And we've had another couple of questions as well. Uh, what are the taxes for RACDAO um, if it's 100% owned? We'll touch on that later. And if I trade in the UAE and my UAE company is owned by another company outside the UAE, is there any tax on the trades made? Uh, we'll touch on tax later, but I'll answer that particular question. So, from a UAE perspective, you would be charged nine percent. You would be taxed nine percent um, on profits over one hundred thousand dollars if you were deemed a UAE taxable entity and if you had substance and various other things. What other countries? Uh, view in terms of tax, we can't really comment on that without tax advice from that particular company. But as a generality, normally, if the UAE has a tax treaty with the particular country, you can take dividends back to your home country without any tax, whether it be withholding tax, income tax, corporation tax, etc. Um, if you're taking it uh, personally, then it's likely that you'll still um, be liable for um, income tax in your home country. And uh, Sharik has also said, which offshore company is available for crypto in the UAE? So ultimately, any offshore company is available um, because the offshore company isn't actually the operational entity. The offshore company um, is, is where you kind of structure, where you put the legalities, the agreements, et cetera. 
it's not where you actually do the trade or where you or it's, and, and also it's extremely difficult for a holding company to get a bank account if the holding company also adds in a crypto element it, it's much more difficult so what you do is you use the holding company purely for the structure purely for the robust legal system and then banking facilities are below at the operational company level um, and, and any other comments on jurisdictions, Johannes, before we move on? No, I think we've covered, you've covered everything that's uh, required to cover from those. Okay, great. Um, so what are the taxation and financial benefits of the UAE? Um, corporation tax has just been introduced, but it's only at a rate of 9% of profit over $100,000. So unlike other countries, uh, you actually want to take less dividends here and more salary. Whereas in every other country that I'm aware of, it's more beneficial to take dividends from a tax perspective rather than taking income, um, which is usually taxed at a higher rate. Uh, VAT ultimately is a consumer tax, but it's only at a rate of 5%, which is which is very low. Um, there are some exceptions to corporation tax. So it was expected that there would be um a broad brush exemption for free zone companies but unfortunately that's not the case but there are a list of exemptions that we can look at or we can look at look at with a tax uh, specialist um and and the exemption can mean that for first two years for example if your turnover is less than a certain amount you pay no you pay no corporation tax even if you have a high profit or there are some exemptions that are for the for the life of the company so you can have like a, you can still have a completely tax free company and in terms of employees and personally, there's no income tax and there's no capital gains tax. So let's say I buy Bitcoin today at X and I sell it in one month's time for 3X. Um, I, I don't have any tax on that from a UE perspective. Um, the, the UK might have a have a view if I go back to the UK within a certain period of time, but from the UE perspective, there's no tax. And it's a very moderate tax rate it's a robust infrastructure, it attracts investment, and ultimately that's why the UE is um is such a good uh, jurisdiction to set up. Um, moving to the sort of process, so this is where um I I'll give you a general overview of how to set up a company, but we will then defer to Hannes's expertise um for the regulatory element because that's really that's really the key point that we want to discuss today. So when you're setting up a company in Dubai, there's more than 60 legal jurisdictions where you can set the company up. So um, every jurisdiction has its own procedure, has its own price, has its own benefits, has its own advantages, has the disadvantages. So sometimes there's no real difference between one and two. Sometimes there's a huge benefit to going with one over the other. And what a lot of people do at the beginning is they make the mistake of trying to go for the cheapest possible option or only thinking about what they need today. Because if your company is successful, which obviously you want it to be, you need to have a place where you can expand, where you can have a bigger office, where you can get more visas, where you can grow. Um, because in the UAE, um, the visa quota, which is essentially how many people you can hire, is linked to your office space. So if you set up in a jurisdiction that has no offices, for example, which do exist here, then yes, that would be suitable when you've got one or two employees, but when you need to hire 10 people, you can't. And it's not easy to move from one jurisdiction to another. Obviously there's documentation, there's compliance and various other things, but that, that's what you would expect now in any other jurisdiction. Then once we've chosen the jurisdiction, we apply for the license. So if it's unregulated, then you get the license um, and, and you move on. If it's regulated, it depends on what type of regulation there is. But usually for um, crypto related companies, you have to do an I IDQ, which is an initial disclosure questionnaire at the beginning. You need to get initial approval from VARA and only then can you issue your license. So you can't get visas, open bank accounts, do anything like that without the initial approval. And a lot of people think that they can just come and get visas straight away. That's that's not the case. Um, then you have your license. You Once you have the license, you can start visas. Uh, simultaneously, you can you can look at the operational permit for, for VARA, uh, which, which Johannes will touch on. And once you have a visa and an Emirates ID for the person in charge of the company, only then can you apply for the bank account. So you can't you can't apply for UAE banking without having an Emirates ID. It's a central bank um, requirement. And 
um, ultimately it's a sort of barrier. And then you've got to think about your ongoing compliance requirements. So there, there is ongoing uh, crypto uh, regulation requirements. You need to have certain officers, you need to do certain filings, you need to keep certain records, and Ohanis will deal with that. But every company in the UAE has to register for corporation tax, has to file a corporation tax return, even if they're exempt. If you're over a certain turnover, you have to register and file for VAT, or you need to register and apply for an exemption if you do no UAE business. You need to keep accounts. There's economic substance regulations considerations. There's anti-money laundering considerations, but all of those are on a case-by-case basis um, depending on what you do. And it's also um, it's also difficult to kind of give you generalities. Like uh, often people say, how much is it going to cost me? Well, we, we can kind of give you a range, um, but the, the, the cost of regulation is quite substantial. The cost of actually setting up the company in comparison to that is, is, is lower, is, is certainly low. Um, about another couple of questions just before I hand over to Hannes for the, for the, the good part, the compliance. Um, uh, which is the preferred offshore for crypto? It, it really depends on your circumstances, but um, ADGM SPV is, is quite good because it gives you the benefit of having a sort of tier one financial jurisdiction. It's relatively cost effective and it's very, very, um, very, very respectable and, and robust. Uh, there are some solutions in DIFC. There will be some new solutions soon in DIFC, but it really depends on your circumstances, but an offshore company is an offshore company. Um, do crypto trades incur 5% tax? Um, if you're doing it in your personal capacity, no. Um, if you're doing it under a company, it's likely to incur um, 9% uh, corporation tax. Um, what activity can be selected for an offshore crypto? Generally, you don't have an operational company offshore. Generally, the offshore company is just a holding company. You would then underneath have the operational company, Sharik. Um, and what do you mean by jurisdiction? So when I refer to the term jurisdiction, that is a free zone, a mainland. So you have Dubai World Trade Center, you have DMCC, you have Dubai mainland, you have Abu Dhabi mainland. Each of those individually is a jurisdiction and each jurisdiction has its own rules, regulations, processes, advantages, disadvantages, Um. That's really why our company exists here. Like we we wouldn't exist in other countries where there's only one choice. Like in the UK, for example, it's really easy to set up a company. It costs you 150 dirhams, but later you pay 25, 40, 50 percent tax through various various channels. Like you in the UK, you can get charged 25 corporation tax, 25 percent corporation tax, and then 40 percent. Um, income tax on your already taxed amount, which leaves you with about 40% of what you earn. Whereas in the UAE, the maximum you're going to have taken off you is 9%. So the, the running costs and the setup costs, yes, they can be a bit more expensive, but ultimately you're still going to save a lot of money. Um, and I'll pass um, I'll pass this over uh, to you now, Hannes, um, for the licensing procedure. Sure. Uh, thank you, Gary, uh, for the in-depth introduction of how to set up an entity here in Dubai. And basically, uh, that's when usually when virtual zone is done with the client and setting up the entity and everything. That's when our part comes in, which is the supporting them in the li their licensing adventure, uh, just to make sure that they get the license from Vada, understand what it is, and uh, everything in in between. So to talk about the more of the regulatory landscape of uh, and the licenses, different types of licenses that are available here in Dubai. Uh, basically, the VARA covers almost all crypto activities and have a license for each and every one of them. You have the exchange, the broker dealer, advisory, asset management, custody, uh, fiat backed virtual uh, virtual asset issuance, uh, transfer and settlement, uh, lending and borrowing activities. Uh, all of those are require a license, a proper license, a regulated license from VARA. When it comes to distributed ledger technologies at the LT service, this is just a registration and you require an NOC from VARA, which is a no objection confirmation, uh, which is not going to be a regulated activity. But again, it needs to pass by VARA through an IDQ that uh, Gary just mentioned about it, that it needs to be done before the company is set up uh, and get the NOC 
uh, from VARA before uh, the license is issued by the jurisdiction. By the way, just to make it clear, there are two different types of licenses that we're talking about. There's a license from the jurisdiction that are, uh, usually is granted either through the DET or all the free zones that are available here. And then since it's a regulatory, regulated act, if the, your, the activity that the company is doing is a regulated activity, on top of that, you require a uh, license from the regulator, not just the jurisdiction, which in, in this case, it's VARA. Uh, just to uh, continue your operation and be, do it legally and uh, in a compliant manner. Uh, for uh, So uh, basically those are the activities that are covered. Uh, some of the key points that I want to touch, as Gary was mentioning and the question that he answered about, uh, what are the differences between the free zones and all of those? Uh, basically, VARA requires for all types of activity, all licensed activities to have a physical office. So if there's a jurisdiction that doesn't have a physical office uh, here in Dubai, that doesn't work with VARA. You need to have a physical office in order to get one of the licensed activities, as you can see now on the screen. Uh, but for the registration and the knock and the approval for the non-fiat SVA that, you, again, are visible now, those you can be incorporated in a jurisdiction where there is no physical office, as those with a flexi, the flexi desk or a uh, shared workspace uh, is is uh, is accepted as well with VARA. Just to highlight one thing, uh, all the licensed activities that we can see here now on the screen, those are all covered by VARA. All of them can be done through one entity, but the custody services. If, if an entity is offering custody services, it should be set up as a separate entity. It can't do any other activity than custody itself. So if any business wants to do all of the mentioned activities, they should have one entity set up in the UAE doing all but custody and the second entity doing only custody services. Uh, for, uh, for each entity, uh, there's a requirement of two uh, visas, two people on the, on the on floor here in UAE who have their Emirates IDs and are full-time employees of the VAST. One of them being the chief compliant officer and the other is uh, needs to be someone with high enough seniority in the entity. Usually companies opt to go with the managing director or the CEO. So two people must be a full-time employee of the VAST uh, that is incorporated here in UAE. That's, one, uh, the, that's another requirement that to highlight on. Uh, by the way, to talk about the, mainly the process of how to get the license, it's a, with VARA, it's basically a three-stage process. The first process starts, as Gary mentioned, through the, ID, through the IDQ submission, which is uh, around 35 set of questions, questions that we need to uh, answer them. Uh, this is something that ACX supports our uh, clients with as well. Uh, we need to answer 35 sets of questions, including uh, overview of the activity, the business plan, the documentation, the CVs, the background of the people involved with this entity, uh, financial projections of how the entity is going to be set up, current financials, or uh, it can be a commitment from the owner, commitment from the parent entity as well, and whatever. Uh, and there are some other questions, including uh, what's the business model, how the uh, client flow, how the money flow is going to happen, when and where, uh, if uh, the entity is touching client funds or not. So those are answers that needs to be answered in the IDQ setup. This is for VARA to understand the type of business that the company is uh, the, trying to do here in UAE. And accordingly, they will either grant an initial approval, which is basically the uh, initial approval means that you are required to get a full license from VARA. You can't start operations until you do. Or you can get a no objection confirmation, meaning the activity that the entity is doing is not an activity that requires a full license from VARA. You are free to proceed and start operations immediately. Uh, talking uh, about some of the, yeah, as you can see here on the screen, uh, this is the flow when it goes and everything in between. The, when it comes for payments, uh, upon the upon the registration, the applicant must pay the fifty percent of the uh, licensing fee, which is uh, one. Uh, it ranges between forty thousand dirham and uh, one hundred thousand dirham, uh, depending on the activity that uh, that the uh, that uh, that the company is trying to do. 
Uh, by the way, there's a small difference with legacy and uh, new vest, no, and I will touch on it as well. And when it comes to uh, supervision fees, there are again supervision fees ranging between forty thousand to even three hundred, and sometimes more, depending on the risk the risk level of the entity and the number of activities they are doing. The licensing fees and the supervision fees are paid per activity. So if a firm is doing more than one activity, they need to require more. Or they need to pay more than once uh, the licensing fee and the supervision fee. However, the as you can see here on the screen as well, the the second license you pay the fifty percent of the amount to for licensing and supervision. Uh, the third license is fifty percent, and everything after is fifty percent uh, all the way. There's a small difference between legacy and standard vests, but nowadays usually all the vests joining are standard. Uh, the legacy have already registered with VARA at least. Uh, the legacy vests are the vests that were in uh, were actually uh, operational before the existence of VARA, which is the call-off date is February of 2023. So all the vests that are operational here in UAE before February 2023 are considered to be legacy vests, are considered to be the makers of the market. So VARA has a discount for them. VARA has a linear approach to them and to helps them to stay and sustain their operations throughout the licensing process instead of uh, the standard vests that are usually the vests that are joining the market after February 2023. Those are the vests that uh, can't start their operation unless they are fully, fully, fully compliant with the uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, yeah. So uh, to go a bit, a bit deeper uh, in, the con uh, in the conversation here, uh, one of the questions, main, main questions that we are getting are the bank account uh, and how to, get, how to get a bank account in UAE when you're doing a crypto business. Uh, I want to go back to the thing that I said at the beginning of the webinar, where in UAE, you feel like it's a market that welcomes you. They want you to be here. They want you to be compliant and actually perform. There are a lot of banks, uh, at least three or four banks now currently here in Dubai, that are uh, actively onboarding uh, crypto entities. They are trying to work with them. And uh, for sure, if you're having problems there, either you can reach out to me or Gary and we can help you out uh, doing, uh, letting you know how the process works with that. Uh, but yeah, and even one of the banks here, they are getting a license themselves. They want to do custody for... Uh, they want to. They have applied to get the license as well. So that's a huge, huge uh, thing. More than, uh, more than a green flag for them to show the, to the world that they want to onboard crypto entities doing it. Uh, to go on over some of the questions that we have here. Uh, yeah, like the first from Ayman that's saying that what is the status of requirement on regulation for NFT projects. Uh, depending on the type of the projects that uh, you're talking, Ayman, if it's going to be you issuing and selling and offering uh, NFTs in the market, it's a different regulation. If you're a platform that helps people initiate their projects, it's a different story. So I can't give out the right answer unless I know a bit more details about the, uh, what are you trying to achieve and uh, actually uh, have a more look at your business model and business plan. Happy to help uh, if you uh, if you if that's required. And uh, please, for, um, and our, this, please, please, please put some questions in, guys. We've we've actually kept we've kept twenty minutes. Um, I, I've answered quite a few of the questions by typing. Um, however, if you've got any specific questions that you want to ask me on the setup side, or you want to ask Johannes on the regulation side, n now is your chance. Um, feel free to put them in. We'll try and answer every question. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Uh, so going to the next question, Alan, uh, concerning the annual fees, the, the licensing fee is a one time fee that you pay to get the license. But the supervision fee, it is an annual fee. Yes, it's an annual uh, paid once a year for the just as a supervision fee to make sure for the uh, for the regulator to sustain their operations and make sure that everybody is compliant with it. Uh, Ash, can you uh, can you state uh, who the banks are? Uh, actually, Zentbank and Amio Bank currently are uh, the leaders in uh, when it comes to crypto, and they can actually uh, they are looking forward to onboarding crypto firms in, uh, within their operations as well. They have a portfolio of them. Uh, 
and I, I'm yeah. I'm aware I can I can't disclose who, but I'm aware um of an international bank onboarding custody, um so it's not it's the international bank who have a, an office um in the UAE they're licensed in the UAE but they are they're deemed as an international bank rather than a local bank so um the banking position gets better and better every day um dealing with us regarding your specific scenario we can guide you on what the best solution is and sometimes there isn't a solution in the UAE but there's a solution in another country and we can we can help guide you and uh, through that yeah just want to touch back on the b banking one as well uh concerning the regulated activities that are regulated by the regulator here but uh, you need to have a UAE bank account, a bank account controlled by the uh, uh, CBUAE licensed entity, which is basically a bank that has offices here in UAE. And that's where uh, the regulator is offering a non-operational license at first, up until like if you've done more than 90 to 95% of the uh, regulatory requirement, you have completed them you'll get a non-operational license, which helps you immensely in getting a bank account as well. So the banks deal with the uh, VASPs that have the non-operational license in a completely different way. They understand that Bara has uh, reviewed them, Bara has given their green light on them. And there are a couple of points that are required to, uh, to achieve the full operational license, which usually one of them would be the uh, bank account opening. Yeah, and I think Sharik is one. Yeah. yeah. What, what what's the requirements for an offshore setup for crypto? So th this is where there's a little bit of confusion. So you should try not to set up an offshore company for crypto. You should try and set up a free zone company for crypto. Um, free zone gives you the ability to get a visa, gives you an easier ability to get a bank account. And then you have the choice. Do you trade as a prop trader under the company or do you trade as an individual just with a visa and the company ultimately is non-operational? Um, non there's also, for those who have a lot of funds or a lot of capital that they can tie up, um, you can come here and if you buy 2 million dirhams worth of property, you can get a golden visa. If you put a certain amount of money in the bank account, you can get a golden visa. So the the, the key thing is a visa if you're trading in your, your own personal capacity. And then Salik has asked, what about a non-crypto media startup? Um Media City would be the obvious choice, but it's quite ex quite expensive. Mainland, uh, cost-effective free zones also work, depending on your business model. And I think, uh, Johannes, Iman's come back with more details on the NFT project. Um, so he said that issuing and selling your own NFT is not an NFT marketplace. So the people who buy the NFTs, some are in the UAE, most are outside of the UAE. Would that be regulated or not? Uh, so basically, you're providing the for you're providing the platform for people to issue and sell their NAT, uh, NFTs on it. So technically, it's considered to be a marketplace because people are able to sell their NAT, NFTs on your product. Again, if I understand correctly from you, what you have mentioned, uh, dealing with outside of UAE uh, and inside of UAE, as long as the entity is set up in UAE, you need to, you need to have a license. And if you don't have the license, you can't offer to people inside the UAE, even as an international entity. So if an enti international entity wants to offer to clients inside UAE, they need to they need to be regulated by the regulator here in UAE. Happy to jump on a call afterwards, uh, Ayman, and we can discuss in details. You can reach me out. My email address is there. We can go uh, into more details about your project and basically uh, and your uh, requirements. Yeah, and we can also look at whether if, if you really don't want to go down the regulated route, we can look at what we would strip out and, and what you could fit into Rackdow, for example. Um, but it just depends, really depends on the scale. Like if you're if you're going to be doing a turnover of a million dirhams a year, then it just doesn't justify the costs. But if it's going to be a large scale, then yes, you need to be regulated. So it's changing the business model to be compliant versus meeting the compliance requirements. Uh People are trying to steal all the information from us about the banks and about everything. So Zanair's asked again about what, which are the crypto-friendly banks. So the main the main player is Zand, Z-A-N-D. Um, other banks are friendly. Some jurisdictions have tie-ups with the bank that allow prop trading. Let us know what you need. Um, contact us and we, we can help guide you through the process on the banking.
Um, Alan has asked, can you explain the supervision fee a little bit more? So I think, Alan, it, it depends. If, if you're going for a full crypto license, then you need to get regulated. If you are looking to just set up the company so that you can trade in your own personal name, that's different. But I, as I understand it, Hannah's, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the supervision fee is just an annual fee for VARA making sure that you are compliant. Um, it's just that it's essentially it's a regulator fee. Exactly, Gary. It's just to uh, it's just a fee to, to maintain the license, license maintenance fee, if you want. And then Ruben has asked, is Wheel crypto friendly? So, yes and no. Um, if you're a crypto company and you want to set up uh, with Wheel, no, it's not friendly. Um, if you're on an offboarding money through a, a regulated exchange, yes, it is friendly and it has multi currency accounts, so you can do dollars and euros and pounds, et cetera, which is quite good. Um, I don't know if they have or they may be, or I've heard a rumor that they, that they might actually be bringing um, crypto trading into their personal account platform. At the moment with Wheel, I know for sure uh, you can you can trade the SMP, you can buy Tesla, you can buy like well-known American stocks. Uh, I, I heard a murmur that they may be introducing crypto trading um, to individuals. Um, so watch this space. Um, Ruben has asked again, can you go over the difference between regulated VARA operations and RACDAO? So RACDAO is non-regulated activity. So in simple terms, if your activity falls under the regulated list that Hannah shared earlier in this presentation, then you have to have regulation. If it doesn't fall under that list, then it doesn't need to be regulated. So RACDAO, the popular activities are proprietary trading, so trading under the name of the company. You can get a bank account, whereas in most other jurisdictions you can't. Um, provision of IT services or blockchain services to crypto companies. That's very, very popular. Advertising for crypto companies, that's popular. Um, services to crypto companies, that's popular. And also crypto companies that want to outsource their talent. So they want people to be based here. They don't want to put them under their employment or they don't want to set up an entity here themselves. They just pay the money for the individual to get a, a, a permit that allows them to invoice the company and have a visa to live here. Um. Yeah, just want to touch on that again, yeah. uh, Gary, concerning the difference between VARA and RACTAO that Ruben just asked. Uh, as Gary mentioned, it all depends on the activity that you're doing. Prop trading is included in VARA's, uh, not, uh, VARA's uh, list as well. Again, with VARA, prop trading is not a, a regulated activity. It's, a, it's an activity that just requires a registration with VARA. It doesn't, it's not a licensed, uh, licensed activity from VARA. So all the fees that we shared previously, those are not implemented on you, even if you are with VARA. However, there are some advantages, as Gary mentioned in the beginning, that do between different free zones and different things. With, within RACTAO, if an activity is not regulated, you can register there. The difference between RACTAO and all the other free zones is that if you have an if you have a, an activity that needs to be get licensed, you can set up your entity there. You need to set up an entity there when it comes to non non regulated activities, and that's something that Gary and his team uh, support and uh, do it uh, full time basically. And I I have a question of my own, Hannes. Um, I actually don't know the answer to this. Uh, so, um, is is VARA federal? Is VARA UAE wide or is VARA only only Dubai? Uh, no, VARA is only Dubai. Yeah, mainland so, Dubai and the free zone except the IFC, but yeah. it with the government of Dubai, not UAE. Correct. So my understanding is so one of the main reasons that RACDAO doesn't have regulated activities is because there's no regulator for Raz Al-Khaimah yet. And if you but do... it's prop, coming. It's coming, yeah. But if you do prop trading in... If you do prop trading in Dubai, then you need to register with VARA. At the moment, if you do prop trading in RACDAO, I don't think you need to register. Um, You may have some... No, no, no. Yeah? Hmm? No, 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 no required to registration. But if you go with a exchange to RACDAO, you can set up your exchange from RACDAO. Right. Yeah. Basically, that's the difference. Be depending on the activity that the entity is trying to do, there are different options and different mazes that uh, usually entities need to walk through. And Gary and his team are here to 
actually simplify those mazes to you. Yeah, and Rack, just there's a bit of confusion about kind of what Virtuzone is, what ACX is, what a jurisdiction is. So Virtuzone ultimately is a, an independent company formation specialist. So in the UAE, there are 60 govern, government or quasi-government entities where you can set up a company. So there's 50 free zones. There's mainland, there's offshore. Um, we are not a free zone. We are a, a consultancy that points you in the right direction of the free zone or points you in the right direction of the mainland. And ACX compliance are the guys who will help you with the VARA regulations, the regulatory requirements, the money laundering requirements, the officers that you need, the outsourcing of certain things that you're allowed to outsource. Um, that That's our role. So we are, we are not a free zone. So that it doesn't make a difference to me if you go to Rackdow, DWTC or DMCC. Ultimately, I want you to have the right solution and we guide you through that. Um, another question, again, this is one I don't know the answer to, Johannes. Do you, do you guys provide company directors? Uh, we do not provide company directors. However, we provide all the support required for that director uh, to do his job. If, uh, as I said earlier, there needs there needs to be two separate full time employees for the vast, and those people should be working only and only for the vast. So they can't be under registered under two different entities. They can't be a part time employee. Two people at minimum needs to be a full time employee with the vast. Usually, one of them, or the, by law, one of them should be the chief compliance officer, and the second one must be someone with enough seniority, that's how VARA calls it. Uh, usually they go with the director of the entity or the CEO, managing director, whatever uh, the title is. Uh, our team in ACX, we support the compliance officer, we support the director. So other than those two people, the entity who is working with us, they don't need to hire a third person. So minimal office space will suffice for them. They don't require additional visas. They don't require anything else. We'll be in the background working, uh, doing the work for them. As I said in my introduction, we're the boring company doing everything in the background just to make sure that the entity is compliant with the regulators. Perfect. And then Sharik has asked the question, can an existing free zone company accept and make payments in crypto or trade in crypto? So in my view, and 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 you and you 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 may have your own view, Hannes. In my view, uh, theoretically, yes, you can accept crypto. Um, however, I would advise you against it because some of the organisations who regulate the transfer of crypto haven't quite caught up yet. So you may find yourself in trouble with one of the government organisations because they don't they they don't understand where the money's come from, the source of funds, et cetera, et cetera. But if your company is going to trade in crypto, if it's in Dubai, um, it, it needs to have the prop trading activity and it needs to um, take the lesser registration, I think, with VARA. Is that right, Johannes? Yes. Again, depending on uh, what the type of the activity is, what uh, what the entity is there to do, what is the prison license that they have and what are they trying to achieve. So it's all activity based. It's all business model based. Uh, it's a tough question to answer uh, within just a few lines of introductions. Like to get to give you the correct answer, we need to have more additional information for us to understand exactly what are you trying to achieve and what's your long-term goal, short-term goals. All of that is just to give you the best solution as a next step for you. Uh, there's a, a question from Bruce. Um... My question specifically is if you're an artist or a graphic designer only making images or NFTs, you're not a marketplace of the platform. How does this work? So my view would be that Rackdown would be perfect for that. It's an, an unregulated activity. It's an environment where you might pick up customers. Um, you could also have a... You could also have like a, a design or a, an artistic company in Dubai because ultimately you are an artist it just so happens that your customer is in the crypto world because that um that's often a mistake people make with regulation so if someone has a let's say a portal like property finder where they they show houses or like airbnb people think oh that must then be regulated because it's it's about property 
but that's not always the case. So it's what you are physically doing. And if you're only physically making the drawings and selling the drawings, ultimately all you're doing is art. So uh, an easy, easy company would be absolutely fine for you. And I'm sure Johannes would agree on that. Yes, Gary, exactly. Rakdao is an option and so is, uh, yeah, like it depends again, what uh, what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? What do you want to achieve? If you want to grow as an entity, you want to keep it as a one-person job? What well, Depends on many things, but yeah, generally Rakdao is a very good place to set up that business. I'm reading quite a long question. Just give me a second. Yeah, Hen Henry's question is just a little bit too detailed. Well, we could deal with that separately. Um, Alan is asking, um, can we help with other jurisdictions? Uh, in the UAE, yes. Some offshore jurisdictions outside the UAE, yes. And one actually important question I didn't ask you, Johannes, is you guys, um, obviously, you deal with lots of different countries. So I imagine you, you've kind of rode the wave. So when... Um, when Singapore was looking good for crypto, you probably hit Singapore. When Europe was looking good for crypto, you probably hit Europe. So, how how does um Dubai compare to the other countries? Like, if you could give us examples of other countries that that looked like they were going to be good for crypto, but Dubai is then overtaken. Yeah, basically the main difference that I always try to highlight when it comes to Dubai is the regulations and the regulator are set in a way they have the approach that they want the crypto firms to join the market here. In other jurisdictions, usually it's your traditional financial regulator trying to approach, trying to regulate the crypto industry, whereas VARA has been built ground up to regulate crypto industry. They don't touch anything that is not crypto. They are not your traditional financial regulation regulators. They are just the regulators to regulate the crypto industry. So that's a huge, huge, huge benefit when it comes to joining the UAE market. And to answer the question about other jurisdictions, we as ACX do provide support in other jurisdictions as well, uh, compliance support, customer support, or community management support. <coughs> and for licensing support, uh, we have a team that's, uh, that supports the, uh, that is set up and we're starting to support the MICA regulations in Europe, which is coming in early next year as well as uh, we're setting up now a team to support the Hong Kong uh, licensing uh, as well for uh, VASPs and uh, any activity to, done in the crypto space. Perfect. And then uh, someone's asked if they, if you have a company in um, Medan, can you transfer it to RackDAO? Um, theoretically, potentially, but practically just set up a RackDAO company now. Um, start transferring things over and then close down the Maidan company. Um, it's not, and I am one of the few people who has done jurisdictional migration in the UAE. Um, and honestly, it's not, um, it's not worth um the headache that you get. In my opinion, it doesn't give you much advantage because what you find is that the jurisdictions that conflict. Someone will say you need A before B. The other jurisdiction will say you need B before A, and 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 you're stuck. So theoretically, it's possible, but practically, I would advise against it. Um, so thank you very much for that, guys. Thank you, Johannes. It was very insightful. Um, hopefully, we have answered your questions. It's it's a very, very complicated topic to get through in an hour, but I think we've had some good questions. We've had some good insight. Um, and ultimately, it's important to note that if you do want to explore in this avenue, VirtuZone and ACX compliance will work as a sort of end-to-end -end solution, hand-in-hand. Um, ACX pass us clients, we pass ACX clients because ultimately you don't want a client dealing with 10 different people. You want to have one project manager, one point of contact to guide you through it. And we're quite open and ACX are quite open. If you ask for something that's not within our expertise, we probably have someone who can do it and we'll outsource it, but we'll still remain your point of contact and, and put it in the middle. We, we won't do things that we're not comfortable with, which to be honest with you, most people who are setting up crypto companies are doing. They're, they're just making a hash of it. They're going through the process. They're getting rejections. They're just dealing with each step. And something that should take one or two months is taking a year. So that that's really the value add that you have with working with ACX and, and yourself. And any closing remarks, Johanna? Yeah, just... 
Yeah, I just want to add one thing and add build on what Gary just said. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is to become a one-stop shop for everything that's required to set up your entity, to join the UAE market, and to be compliant with the regulator on the long term. Not just with compliance, not just company setup that Gary and his team do. We have other partners in the space who help with crypto uh, financial audits that is required by the, uh, by the regulation. We have partners in the place who do crypto accounting and uh, bookkeeping. We have partners in place to help you with your cybersecurity and penetration tests and all the other requirements. So we we joined forces with Gary and created a big group of people where we can be the only point of contact and move forward with all your needs that are required to set up an entity. You don't need to go somewhere else. Uh, we have it all set in place for you. And that, that, that's actually a very good point. Like, I didn't know that you would have to have different accounting for crypto. So I just naively thought that the accounting was the accounting. But although we offer normal accounting services, ACX offer crypto specific accounting. So we can do your day to day. We can register you for VAT. We can do your VAT submissions. We can do your corporation tax, et cetera. But we can't go into your ledgers and your, your, um, excuse my inefficiency in the terminology, but we, we can't see what Bitcoin you have, what you don't, what it's worth, what it's not, what you've made, what you haven't. Um, I, I don't even know how you would, you would begin to do it, but having someone who can do it for you and keep you compliant, it's very, very valuable because if you spend six months or a year, you spend a few hundred thousand dirhams getting a license, the last thing you want to do is lose it for not complying with something that could very easily be, be done. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, guys. We, we hope you enjoyed that. It will be recorded. We'll do more, no doubt. Um, And it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.